Is this is it still loud? What is your All picture right. missing? Well, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is. Uh, uh, thank you for letting me speak here today. And, uh, I always love the whole uh, workshop, so I'm very happy. Symposium. Uh, this is joint work with Jonathan Brockhauser, who was uh, interning with me at Microsoft Research over the summer, which was really fun. Uh, but unfortunately, he cannot be here this week. Uh, so I'll give the presentation. Um, and it's like a, a new perspective on a, on a well known problem. And it, it looks like this, right? It's like. Uh, I open a file, I'm going to do something, and I'm going to close the file, and then, well, will the file always be closed or not? Right? That's, that's the question, because I'm using here some external resource. And of course, in, in practice, uh, well, as soon as you have more effects, like exceptions, uh, the file may not be closed, because this action may, may throw an exception. Right? Or if things uh, are, are you know, really uh, more general control effects, maybe you'll try to close the file twice because uh, action returns more than once. Uh, and this is this is the, the problem I want to look at uh, during today's talk. Um, and for exceptions, people have, have many solutions, like languages have uh, finally handlers or automatic structures or using statements or uh, defer or there's all kind of like special cases just to deal with exceptions. Uh, in order to uh, be able to do the previous example, basically. And it's actually, in reality, it's kind of depressing that just for exceptions we have to do all this special work, and it's even more because people do all kinds of language extensions now, like async awake and iterators, and they're very intricate <coughs> interaction with, with the exception handling. So uh, I hope to take a more general view during this talk. Um, Ah, right. So I'm Mr. Algebraic Effects nowadays. Well, one of them. Uh, the other, uh, one of the others is there. And there, well, it's like, fortunately, I have co conspirators. Um, so now you expect me to say, well, with algebraic effects, it's, it's much better. But actually, it's, it's not. I would, it's kind of worse. So <laughs> when I do algebraic effects, I suddenly generalize over control effects. And now any operation might not return, not just throwing an exception, but, but depends on the handler. And uh, any operation may return more than once. I don't know until I, I see the handler. So uh, since I'm working into algebraic effects, I really wanted to look into, can we uh, get a handle on this? And that's what this talk is about today. Um, and before I do that, I give like a, a mini primer on, on algebraic effects. Um, but rather quickly, so if you know it already, uh, just, just take a little nap. Um, so here's, here's the one I kind of talked about. So in, in, in COCA, you, you don't have any control effects in the beginning. You're in a total, beautiful language. And then you can actually define your own effects. So if you want to have exceptions, you would declare a new type of exception, always in teal. And I can declare that type, and I say, well, there's one operation called throw. And it, it takes a string, and it, it, it's, it's a type. Uh, uh, single letters are uh, implicitly polymorphic. That's for all A, string to A. Uh, and then you can already use it. It's like an interface. So I can make my my division function and say, well, y0, then I'm going to use this throw operation. And otherwise, I'll do division. And the type inference system will now uh, infer for you that it takes two integers and returns an integer. But also as the third argument, the arrow, it says, well, an exception might be uh, raised. It basically just infers there's an exception effect here occurring because it saw the throw up here. But it doesn't say yet what it does. So to give it meaning, you need a handler. So here's a, 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 a function that is a handler. So here I say, handle an action you pass to me. And if you return normally, I put a just constructor around it. And if you, but if anywhere inside action, I call throw, you go all the way up here, and then I return immediately with nothing. So this is how exceptions work. They don't get back to where the throw happened. They immediately <coughs> return wherever it is handled. So the, the try function gets something like give me a tongue action that has no arguments. It may have an exception effect 
and maybe more, it's a polymorphic row of E, and a return result. And I peel off the exception effect because I'm handling it, but I'm wrapping the result in a maybe constructor. Uh, so now you can do try and call it with an anonymous function that, that does the my div and then you will get nothing back because I'm trying to define it. Everybody gets that? Yeah, that's easy enough. So here's one that resumes once. So I make a new effect, oh, I'll call it input and it can read and return a string. So if I do the, the world function, if you say read, I'm going to actually it's going to be in the, in the action, it's going to go all the way up to read, and then it says, oh, I'm going to resume right where I was with the return result, world. And this is where the power comes in from algebraic effect handles, that you get this resume function that lets you get back where you were. So world, hello, plus read would be hello world. All right, so then we have the, the less well-behaved ones. And those are the, the, the ones that can resume more than one. So here's the, the, the famous ambiguity effect where you can flip a coin and return true or false. And what I'm going to do now is if I flip, I'm first going to resume where I was with false, and then I get a list back of results, and then I'm going to resume again with true. And in the end, I have to always wrap it in, in a singleton list because I'm listing it now to the list uh, monad. And now you can have an expression, which is just boolean, flip and flip. But once you handle it, you get a, a list of all possible results back. How cool is that? So this is why people think probabilistic programming would be nicely done using, using algebraic effects. But of course, this is really risky if you do side effects right here, and you resume more than once. So that's what we're going to try to control. So a, a nice thing that not that, that maybe not uh, exposed well is that handlers <laughs> encapsulate uh, really well. And what I mean by that is, and we saw our original example with the, the open the file and close the file, I pass the handle around to the action. But if I have handlers, I can say, well, I'll make a new effect file as an interface, and you can just read, and you get a string back. So now I don't expose the file handle. And now inside the with file function, I can, I can open the file and I can start handling the, the action. And when I get read, I'll do the file, the low level file read function where I use my secret file handle, but I don't expose the file handle to, to the action itself. So you now are completely, you kind of have all the, the state here uh, isolated in the one handler. Well, while the action itself doesn't have access to it. And it's almost like the read, the interface, gives you kind of a, a little hook to, to get back to the handler, use, use the file handle, and then resume again where you were. So that's, that's actually a, a really powerful way of encapsulating uh, internal state. And here's now where we can start trying to reason about a program. Um, so here, what I would like to do is somehow guarantee that when I call action here, that I will always come back without throwing exceptions. And to do that, um, uh, well, maybe I'll see next, first give an example where it goes wrong. So here is my file handler again, now defined as in the previous slide. Uh, and if I now use my previously defined throw, oops, right, the file will never be closed, because it will go all the way up. Or if I do flip, uh, I'll, be, I'll be resuming more than once right here. First with true and then with false. And then I come, I'll come here and I'll first close it. And then I close it again. Can, can everybody still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, maybe I'll, it's, it's this thing. Around here, mm -hmm. then with file, mm -hmm. 
and then it, it'll flip, right? So the amp, where is it? The amp, when it sees flip, it will go all the way up, resume where it was with false, it will go all the way to the end of the program, it, it talks the empty list, it comes back with the empty list here, and then it does resume through, it will go again where it was, again until it hits here, the empty list, come back with that one, and then return the, the 10. So if the file is in between, right, what will happen here is I go flip, I go up to amp, I'll come back with false, I'll go to the end, into the width file, I'll, I'll close the file, go back, Typically and then I come back again with true, and I'll close again. Typically you have amp, with amp and inside with file. Yes. Right? So. If I turn it around, we're good. Yeah. If I do amp here, with file, amp, yeah, then I'm good. Because then I do a little, like locally, I'll, I'll keep resuming. So that's a very good remark. So I want to accept amp inside here, but I want to reject amp outside of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, that's, that's perfect. So to do that, to get a grip on this, uh, we define this notion of control flow linearity. And this is all about knowing if a function, how often it can return. Because that's really what I want to know. I want to know here when I do a read file that the action here doesn't do these funky things of multiple resumptions. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Let's try this. Can you still hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, so I want to get a grip on that. So we define this. So we say linear things are if you call the operation, it comes back once. Guaranteed. Nothing else, right? If I'm a board, then if I call the operation, it will just never come back. Well, a find, well, maybe it comes back, maybe not, but at most once. And then while this is like ambiguity, like uh, maybe never, maybe twice, maybe five times, right? Completely uh, out there. So these are these are the different, uh, this, this, this form a kind of little lattice that we can join upon. So a board is master board, right? Say a one. board is master board. Master board, right? It, almost, it, it doesn't really occur except for like throw. Uh, but then if, as soon as you write a little function around it, an if statement, it'll, it'll become a find. Yep. Yes. So it's, it's a little out. I mean, it, it could probably not have it, but it fits nice in the theory. So. Um, and then, as a first step, and I'm all going to show the simplest system, I'm going to just <coughs> annotate effects with what they promise to deliver. So they promise to say, well, exceptions, well, they will always abort these, these operations. And files, they will always return nicely. And ambiguity will be wild. Right? So we can always do wild. Uh, but some may be annotated a little, a little bit more restrictive. And now we can, for example, infer, ah, right. So that's, that's, this is, you know, ingredient one. Ingredient two is qualified types. So now, when I, for example, with file, it takes this action I'm going to execute. Uh, and what I want from this action is that it doesn't behave uh, 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 in a wild way. So I'm going to say, whatever the extra effects are that you're going to have, they must be at most linear. Because in with file, I'm kind of relying on it that it doesn't exit. Uh, too much or too often. So now with qualified types, I can express that constraint and have it automatically uh, be propagated. So you say it comes from files, so the reasoning is in one effects pro they should all have the same uh, whiteness level? Um, no, uh, but that's also a, a, a way to do it. But in this particular case, it comes from when we check the file handler, we annotate the handler 2 as linear, because file was annotated as linear, and therefore we, that, that constraint comes up. So and there, there are more liberal designs possible. I'll show later uh, how to do that, but I want to show the simple system first. Yeah. So, but this is in fact for the body, for the implementation of with file, um, the annotation. No, it's because it's handling specifically the file effect. The handle state, yes, it is the body with file, and in there is the handle statement, and it handles file, and therefore it, that handler should be linear. Um, you, 
Yes, right. That, that, so uh, uh, Nick said that uh, uh, maybe the annotation should not be on the effects, but on the handlers. And that is right. Uh, you can uh, do more liberal uh, variations of this. And I wanted to show the simplest one first, but it clearly underestimated the audience. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, in our technical report, we do it different. Right. You, you annotate the handlers, because those are the ones that that in the end say how, uh, what your expectations are. Uh, and, but it still uses the same qualified types. You just get more complicated types because it means that uh, when you use the operations, they're often still polymorphic in their linearity. They will get once you've defined the handler. Uh, so you get less checking, but right. it can be done without uh, extra uh, deep complications. Right? So, um, so this E in this case, the pure and linear, right? That's that's it. So the e, e there can be pure. There can be no effect. That's also linear. That's also linear. Okay. Yes, right. The empty row. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There is just, there's just two relations here. If you look in the in the paper, we define two, right? Like one is really on the individual effects, and then there's a the, the constraint relation is over the row of effects. Um, Thanks. Sorry. Uh, uh, so constraint solving. Just if you have these constraints, you can quickly reject many uh, programs. Like here, you would reject it because uh, the action effect will have now exception in it. Uh, and that's, that doesn't satisfy the linearity constraint. And then if you do flip, it will have the wild uh, effect in it. It won't satisfy it. So these, these will now be statically uh, rejected once you try to apply with file to it. Um, but and, that, oh. that, this, this, oh, right, no, no, sorry. If you had an AMP inside there, it would be fine. Yeah. It would be fine, right. So, yes, so if you put AMP inside here, you're kind of ahead of my slides, but yes, then <laughs> this effect is, is uh, handled and it doesn't appear anymore, and E will, will be with whatever is left. So that will be fine. AMP out of it. Yeah. Uh, and the nice thing is that the qualified types kind of just do the right thing once you get the constraints correctly. They just uh, bubble up uh, without any uh, orthogonal to the rest of the type system. Um, so there's a third ingredient necessary, and that is uh, all these annotations are kind of a promise. They say, well, file will be linear, right? Or, the, or exceptions are aborting. Well, now I have to check in each handler if it satisfies that promise. And there's two parts to that. So one of them is, in each operation clause, you shouldn't use uh, more liberal operations yourself. So if you, for example, do, do the, the read for the file handler, you shouldn't flip inside your, your read clause themselves. And then you can, you can kind of secretly resume more than once. Uh, but it's very easy to check, because that's, again, it's a type system constraint. And the second thing is, uh, it's really about how often am I going to resume mm -hmm. kind of the linearity of the, of the resumption as a value. Uh, and checking that, ah, oh, that's hard, because now it, you need something else. Mm -hmm. right? And the second part, what we do currently, is we say, well, uh, the control flow linearity is in itself kind of really useful to identify. And this is an orthogonal problem to it. Like, how do you do this? So in the paper, we'll just... Uh, or the tech report will be online next week. We have a syntactic restriction on it. So we syntactically check is, is the resume used linearly or not. So it's a bit like tail call optimization, so it has to obviously be linear. Yes, right. It is like tail call, yes. It has to be obviously linear. But you can imagine doing something more advanced based on a linear type system. So I'll give a sample of that in, in two slides. So uh, hold your breath. Uh, so now we just syntactically <coughs> check. We say uh, if it's linear, it must basically you must start with the resume, and resume shouldn't occur anywhere else. So now we're sure you resume. The last thing you do is resume here, uh, and this actually uh, works great for almost all operations. And then the others are obvious to how, how to do it. In the wild, you just don't care. 
Um, but a few where it doesn't work, right? And that's particular like async await, where you kind of want to store the resumption in some first class queue and then later reschedule the right one. So how do you ever know uh, you're really resuming only once? And I think the only um, solution to that I know is, is I think, or, or, or it's probably linear type systems. So I wanted, oh, sorry. You could use a dynamic check instead like the drop. That would so you would have to possibly adopt it. You have a privilege operation that takes a while thing, and then if you try to resume the second time, you fail instead. Ah, yes. So one solution is right. The runtime check that would be very easy, right? It's, if the user promises linear, with just a little counter in the resumption, and then if you try to resume more than once, you fail at runtime. So we implement that as well, right? That's the handler at the top level. Yes, well, it's, it, but, but it's a, in Coca, the language I'm working on, it's a little ugly because now there's this new effect you're having of, yeah. of failing at runtime. And usually you need to show that in the types. So I would add an exception effect to such handlers everywhere. Maybe okay, like in Haskell, people don't care about it either. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Right, multi-core camel does this. So here, well, in multi-core camel, it's also uh, you really can't do it, right? So well, you can specifically do things. Yeah. I mean, you, so have, you have effects that are there, real effects, and not just the right effect. I mean, the native. Yeah, but I want to. I want to kind of like. Each, uh, I'll give a very fun example of a native effect that turns out to be wrong if you really think about the semantics of algebraic effects, which we thought was right. Uh, I'll show it in a, okay, yes, please. I'll keep going, but otherwise I'll, it takes too long. Um, so I wanted to say linear types could really work here. And I, and I think they, they really fit uh, with each other very well. So I think what is different with control flow linearity versus linearity, usually in type systems, that's, that's in type systems is always about the many variants uh, from uniqueness typing and, and various linear type systems, but it's also about consumption of a value. Like you want to consume something once, right? Or discharge it from the context once. Uh, but here we're talking about uh, like how can you use a function in your context? It's just kind of an almost dual to it. Uh, but if you would have linear types, now you could check, for example, that the handle is actually used once, like as, as a linear resource. Like control flow linearity gives you a way to reason locally now. Uh, a linear type system would now give you, together with that reasoning, the, the capability of reasoning that this is used linearly. Um, and I think that's, that's where the power uh, comes in. So, so if you would just have a linear type system, it would be very hard because you don't know what, when is action happening and when are the, the reads happening. So you really, I think you really need both. And of course, if you have a linear type system, you can make this syntactic check truly uh, like a real check. Although you need a sophisticated type system for async, because there you would store them in a list, so you would have lists of linear things, linear functions that you must, a linear list of linear functions that you must consume somehow in the end. I'm, I'll keep going, because otherwise uh, uh, I want to show some fun examples. Ah, here, yeah, heap references. Ooh. Native effects that don't work with algebraic effects. So here's run st. It takes a second rank type for all heaps s. I have a stateful effect s and some result and then the result back. Because it's a, a rank 2 type, it guarantees the references can never escape. If I make new references, they have the s parameter in it, and later I generalize over it. So there's no way it can escape the scope. It's like a a Haskell thing, if you're familiar with it. So Coca has it too, and, and here's how the types look. And it, it always tracks, oh, stateful effect in S, but also references in S. So just to make sure they can't escape. Well, it turns out this goes wrong in, in reality, because I've implemented run ST using the real heap, like my native effect. But now if I do amp around it, and I do flip here, when I get back here the second time, first I would say uh, I'll return a, a 1, right? 
And then according to real algebraic semantics, if I go again, I should get the same state that was here and again get one. But of course, I've updated the heap. And the second time I resume here, I read the value that was still there in the heap, and I'll get two out. And it seems like a you know, silly example, but it, it's really deep because we have these proofs in the Haskell world that run as t is, is truly parametric, and therefore it's really safe, right? it cannot leak. And we could, for example, implement run as t by allocating a region of memory, doing everything, and when we get out, deallocating the whole region because we're sure there's no reference to it. But now, with an algebraic effect, I suddenly break the parametricity because mm, I, I somehow have still an entry point in code that can refer to it. And that's a very, uh, I think, it's, there's something uh, interesting, very interesting going on there, right? That it breaks parametricity that way. Maybe it's not good, or, or I, I'm not sure. So it, it, I think it's worrisome, and I would like to better understand what's going on there. But the nice thing about the system I just showed is that we can now give run as t an even more complicated type. So it's rank two, but then we say the, ro the, the polymorphic effect row must be affine at most. And now it's at least safe to use again. You can't do, you can't do this example anymore. Uh, another way, of course, is to, uh, to have a non-native run as t that when when you do the ambiguity, it would capture the entire heap state uh, every time. Uh, oh man, the time flies. Uh, uh, yeah, well, um, the final example is very restricted because I didn't show that you could do any exceptions in there. And usually, like file reading is itself can have exceptions. Uh, and then it means that you can't implement a clause like this because now you raise exceptions in your own handler. Well, that's, uh, you can actually get around that by doing a, a complicated wrapping and unwrapping, but it shows you can get from a fine back to linear if you're going to be explicit about it. Uh, so what you can do is you, you can change your file uh, interface a bit by saying, well, I can try reading and maybe I succeed with a string. And you write a little wrapper here that says <coughs> read is now just try read and it, it will throw if, if things go wrong. It's another exception effect in there. And then in your handler, you have to explicitly handle those effects. So you, you do your action in a try. So if action throws any exception, it's a fine. We're going to catch it. And we resume by a try over the read. Right? So that gets converted to a main value. And it's very, oh my god, okay. it's very important to, to catch the exceptions here and then first propagate it back the way it were because you want the exception to raise in the context where it's called, not, not here, where it would be, it would be wrong. Um, and then once you've done all that, you can close your file safely and then uh, retraw again if necessary. Uh, so this is this is how you can get from affine uh, to linear, except very specific case exceptions. So that's not entirely satisfactory. So in Coca, there's actually kind of an automated way to do this, and I call those finally clauses. And then it starts to look like C++ again, <laughs> uh, JavaScript, right? Uh, I think actually C++ started <coughs> finally, so it's safe. Uh, JavaScript, right, uh, uh, where you just have an extra clause that, that does the closing, and, and uh, that's still active research, especially with respect to the typing, because we feel you can now, instead of having linear affine here, uh, but we're still working on that. And then there's also, uh, cool, you can go from wild to linear, uh, or to affine, really, with initially clauses, where you kind of reopen files every time you get re- uh, resumed again, uh, but it, it, it's still active research, but if you're interested in talking about it, I would love to do it. I think there's like an interesting uh, connections going on there uh, between linearity and, and these constructs. Um, it, it, it's a difference like C++ it's also reminds us a bit of like dynamic wine. 
Yes, yeah. yes, I mean, that's exactly problem. it. Right? That is the problem. Yeah. I think this is called dynamic wine, yeah. where you can reinitialize, right? And it's exactly the problem it, it does. And in a way, it's much nicer than JavaScript because this would be general for any effect, right? Not, not just exception. Uh, it's pretty tricky, though. Um, well, I have too little time, so I'll just keep going. Um, there's another cool thing about uh, uh, about all of this that you can do real cool optimizations. So normally when I compile to JavaScript, I have to do kind of a CPN translation of the code. So every operation would actually get translated in something like this, where it takes a continuation and it plots arguments, and that's expensive. But if I know that read is linear, then I know I can kind of do just a method call that, that I find dynamically, and then when it returns, that's, that's the answer. And then I don't have to do this. And that's a big, actually a big win in practice on, on JavaScript, or, or if, you, if you compile to a host where you don't control the stack. But and finally, ah, there's real type rules. Uh, here's kind of what, where, where uh, the remarks were upon, where I say, ah, actually you have to annotate handlers. And then you have rules here that say how. And here already you can be a bit more general than normal. And you can make it even more, more general uh, by saying uh, you don't annotate the effects, but only the handlers. And you polymorphically propagate the constraints until they're, they're actually resolved. It also means you delay your error messages and you cannot always do this optimization. So, and so there is a tension between like declaring upfront, like, oh, I promise I will always be linear, versus I'm going to be most general and at the last moment decide what I'm going to do. Uh, was five minutes, two minutes? Yeah. Three minutes, and then there will be five minutes. Ah, OK. So I'll, I'll, I'll do the. I'll tell a little bit about the operational semantics, which I think is very interesting. So usually how you do operational semantics is, is using evaluation context. So this is strict language. Evaluate uh, uh, the arguments first, and then no, what? Uh, evaluate the function first, and then its arguments, and then uh, values, and then handlers, like evaluate the matching clause. But an interesting context you can define is if we call H for handler context with some label L, that's the effect you're going to handle. And it's going to say, oh, I'm just like an evaluation context, but it can be no handler in between that handles me. And this is how you can express the innermost handler. Mm -hmm. right? So when I have now a handler rule, in two slides, uh, these are the usual lambda, strict lambda calculus. Uh, evaluation rules, but here are the handler rules. Here I can say, if I see an operation and I have a context, evaluation context, in between uh, that does not handle L, then I'm the innermost handler and I'm going to handle that operation. Well, how are you going to handle it? Well, you must have a clause for it, for the operation. And then you're just going to do whatever it is with the payload you got, and you bind the resumption. And what is the resumption? Well, it takes the resumption value y, and then restores the whole context as you had it, except of lv is now the result y. But it's really simple, and that's beautiful about algebraic effects. And these are deep handlers, because the handler itself is always there too. That's, I think, very important. This makes it correspond to a fold instead of a case. I think we had this kind of course for the limited control already because there is the same thing that you must not capture any reset in the stack. Yes. Um, you can actually, I can give you rules for a, one variant of shift reset directly in terms of, of algebraic handbooks. Right? Right, and, and I was just saying that this presentation is cute. Uh, I've seen it before. It's, it's ah, right. Yes, yes. Now it's kind of, I think I really like it. So you can do. Not. Right, right. So that I think what, what Gabriel was saying was that this way of, of talking about innermost is really is, is cute, but I think really nice too, like doing context like this. Because if you don't do it like this, you'll have to do you have like separate predicates over your context, which I feel are less less obvious. So I really so like the reification of that predicate as a grammar. Right, that's it. Right. So 
so in this in this case, we really use this reification as a grammar in the proof of linearity, and that's what I was trying to get at. So we try to formalize what is it, what do we really mean with control flow linearity, and then. We, did, we had many formulations, and they all turned out to be subtly wrong. And when we did the proof, we always got stuck. And then we had to kind of go back and forth and had mistakes in the proof. It was a very interesting process. But now I think we have it right. Um, but it's still more complicated than you first expect. But basically what we're saying is E is, is control flow linear under some context itself. If you can put a hash just before E, we we'll call it a marker, a linear marker, and we want to kind of prevent you from evaluating outside of it, except through the right handlers. So we say if you can evaluate using a special relation that I'm going to show you to a new context and at the same marker, but now a value here, then we say it's, it's control flow linear. Uh, but it's important that you can still call handlers outside it that are linear, but truly change the context. Um, and so here's that special relation, that, that the one thing, the linear evaluation. You know, it is basically a handler rule again, but it says, well, inside the handler is somewhere the hash, the hash mark. So it means if you want to go to a handler outside your linear context, it better be linear. So how do we uh, uh, enforce that? Well, we make like a fresh secret name that you cannot use, otherwise your evaluation would get stuck and you bind resume to that. And then we just wait until you actually end up with resuming. That would be your linear resume. Uh, and then you continue with that. Uh, and now maybe with a really uh, strange context up here. And I think that's, 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 uh, that's the crucial part. And then if you want to evaluate under the, the marker, that's always okay. And that's kind of captured where you have ambiguity locally. That's fine. You can resume more than once. It's only if you go over a particular point. And, and then with that, you can, you can prove soundness. So in our system with the predicates, if, if, so, if it says the effect is linear, then we can show that any reduction is control flow linear. So we, we can do it under the more restricted relation. Uh, hey, that, that's cool. Thank you. system in the end, right, through soundness on the op operational level. In a way, that's also very satisfying because the operational semantics is, is untyped, so we can truly, we truly show that the type system rules out all the bad things you could possibly do uh, operationally. Yeah, yeah, the, yes, the algebra is not there, right. So, uh, yes, actually, so one of the things we're looking at, now that we have the predicates in there, uh, in qualified types, is to put in more of the algebra back there, where you say, oh, my effect is, you know, has these equations that, that hold on it. So, before at some point when you were talking about linear continuations, you say it's sort of dual, uh, the restriction, like, linearity on values and here we have linearity on the assumption, which is, can I think of it as a limited continuation, so 
Because, I mean, the real thing is, what well, is it sort of dual or is it actually dual using, I don't know, you well, it, it's a, that it, we saw this morning? So I think, so we had a really good reviewer on, the, on our Popol submission, and he, he, he or she said um, that that is very related to like the push by value calculus, uh, where you push your continuations in the context, and then if you would make that linear, that context of the continuations, that might correspond to this formulation. And we, we actually looked into that, or Jonathan did before. And what you do with that is you have to annotate with kind of the co-effect. And it's it's kind of unclear how you would like do type inference for that or check, or check that. And I think with the qualified types, we've got a very natural way of, of doing this that's orthogonal to the rest. So I believe there's this real connection there if you formulate your semantics differently. But I also am not sure, if, I don't think it's entirely obvious, and also not obvious how you would translate that back to a uh, programming language level where you want to program with it. Uh, but that's, I think, why I said dual, because it, it, they become co-effects uh, in, in the, uh, yeah, how to say that? Because they discharge from the context, they become like annotated co-effects. I mean, my question was about and that we that there was this talk this morning from Gabber. Now you say copper for value, but they are too related, so it's not the same question. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I have no idea how to answer it right now, but I, I could do maybe take it offline. I, I mean, I intend to get Gabber maybe to. Ah, uh, <laughs> it's also looking like that. Uh, well, so the limited control is really hard. So you have to be very careful before you try to answer questions about it. Yeah, so, yes, I, I, I thought I, I showed my doubt, right, without being dismissive, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, right. Uh, it's hard to answer for, for sure. <laughs> okay, well, let's thank Darren again.